liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, always known to be at the forefront of science and technology. They put a man on the moon, flew a drone on Mars. They pushed the limit of what we think is possible. Given this, it may surprise you to know that NASA regularly flies planes from 70 years ago. To tell this story, let's start at the beginning. The year is 1944, at the twilight of the Second World War in the United Kingdom. The RAF's de Havilland Mosquito Fast Bombers have proved to be indispensable in the war effort. However, by this time, they're beginning to have trouble keeping up. With the jet age looming on the horizon, the Air Ministry puts out a request for a successor to the aircraft. The new plane was to have no defensive armament whatsoever. Its defense would be at speed and altitude. Many companies submitted proposals, among them the relatively unheard of English Electric Company. They hadn't designed the Spitfire or the Lancaster. In fact, English Electric had not designed any combat aircraft up to that point. But that all changed when aerospace engineer William Petter arrived at English Electric. He hadn't been overly successful so far, mostly working on license-built Spitfires. But he was an ambitious and creative man. He had designed the Westland Whirlwind, which he described as the most radically new airplane which has ever gone into service. And if you look at it compared to other aircraft of the era, there's certainly some merit to that idea. But once he moved to English Electric, he led his team to design an almost as radical design, the Canberra Jet Bomber. This design was chosen to go into the final stages of testing and development for the RAF, taking its first flight in 1949. The Canberra was found to have exceptional high altitude performance and top speed. It was a rousing success. The RAF and pilots alike loved the aircraft delivering tens of thousands of pounds of bombs and ushering in a new age of British aviation. All this caught the attention of the American military's newest branch, the Air Force, who were in desperate need of a fast bomber of their own. The Air Force was engaged in the first jet war in the skies over Korea. Soviet-built MiGs ripped through the American bomber formations, proving that the B-29 and other propeller-driven bombers were becoming thoroughly obsolete. The solution they decided upon was to introduce a new jet-powered bomber to carry out bombing and interdiction missions. Ultimately, the Canberra was chosen. However, there was a major issue. The Canberra was a foreign design, and English Electric would not be able to fill orders for the USAF, as they were already manufacturing at their full capacity for the Royal Air Force. The solution, an American company, the Glen L. Martin Company, the Martin in Lockheed Martin, would license the design and produce the aircraft domestically. The Air Force designated this license-built variant the B-57, the aircraft NASA still operates. So why does NASA use it? Both the RAF and American Air Force found the camera to be extremely useful not only as a bomber, but also a reconnaissance aircraft, extending its service all the way to 2006 in the case of the Royal Air Force. The same aspects that made it a great reconnaissance plane made it ideal for research applications, even compared with newer and more advanced aircraft. Let's compare it to the Lockheed U-2, or ER-2, as it's known in use with NASA. The U-2 does have a higher surface ceiling at 70,000 feet, compared to the Canberra's 60,000 feet. Where it exceeds the U-2, however, is in payload capacity, which is really the main reason NASA still uses them. The Canberra was designed to be a bomber, so a large payload capacity was essential. It can carry 8,800 pounds of equipment to altitude in its spacious payload bays, compared to the U-2's only 2,600 pounds, which must be distributed throughout various parts of the aircraft. Another difference between these aircraft to consider is the ease and safety of operation. The B-57 houses a conventional pressurized cockpit with life support systems consistent with those of any contemporary military aircraft, as well as relatively easy takeoffs and landings. The U-2, on the other hand, requires pilots to wear pressure suits, and makes dangerous and difficult two-wheel landings. So, their high payload capacity, high service ceiling, and relative ease of use keeps these 70-year-old birds in NASA's fleet. As for William Petter, he would sadly die in 1968, but not before having more successful aircraft like the English Electric Lightning and Fallen Nat. Though Petter was a forward-thinking man, 
and an innovator, I doubt anyone would expect that something they created and designed would still be used more than 50 years after their death.